Hi, thanks for stopping by my YouTube channel. I've decided to put together a little video for those of you that are considering coming to one of my all-day seminars or uh, classes on DBA Fundamentals, SQL Server DBA Fundamentals. Uh, just in case you're, you're curious if you're going to learn what you're going to learn and what my teaching style looks like, I wanted to have something for you that you could just kind of point your boss to to help justify any, any costs that are tied for yourself if, you know, I can learn from this guy or I can't learn from this guy because there's different types of people that learn from different types of teaching. I like to teach in a very interactive way. I like to engage for those people that are willing to be engaged. Uh, if you're an introvert and you like to sit at the back of the room, cool. I will leave you alone. That's what you want. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through just very simple, the things that make up a SQL Server database. It's a very simple concept uh, compared to some other database uh, platforms that are out there. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, or as I like to put it, stalk me on Twitter, I love that. Go there and follow me at, at Kevin3NF. If you want a bunch of DBA, accidental DBA, SQL 101 type videos, not sorry, blog posts, occasionally a video, then go to DallasDBAs.com slash blog, or just kind of poke around on the site. I do a lot of, hey, look what I learned today type stuff, which winds up being fundamental as well, even though I've been doing this for almost 20 years because I learn new stuff every day. And the goal of these fundamental classes that I teach is to take basically either accidental DBAs, junior DBAs, or non-DBAs and give you the core foundation of the product so that you can build on that. If you're wind up thrust into the DBA role uh, against your will, if you're a sysadmin or something like that, going to Google is not really the best way to do it. You don't know if somebody out there in the wild has put a good link in there or a bad link for you to click on some code and copy and paste. You certainly don't want to, you know, take random stuff into production with no idea what's happening underneath the covers. Doesn't mean that I'm going to teach you all the internals. That's not my job. That's Paul Randall's job, and he's very good at it. But anyway, just wanted to run through the basics of what things comprise a SQL Server database. We're just going to create one in the GUI, and we're going to look at the guts of it as we do it, and then we're going to verify that it's there. And here we go. This is the SQL Server Management Studio. I know some of you already know that, some of you may not. This is going to be, today we're gonna to connect to my SQL 2014 instance on my laptop, because that's the one that I actually started prior to the video being uh, starting. I also have some 2016s on here, it doesn't really matter. Again, it's a laptop and I just toss stuff on there whenever I need to. When you wanna to connect to an actual instance and in Management Studio, you can connect to more than one at a time. In this case, I'm going to go with my KBH Precision because it's a Dell Precision laptop. It's a really fancy name. I'm going to connect to that, and notice that it's got the 12 here. That is that is a uh, the build number is 12 for SQL 2014. Yes, you're correct. That makes no sense. Microsoft got a little they they got lost between SQL 7 and SQL 2000 because 2000 became 8 because 8 is after 7 and they've never changed it to make any sense. But that's okay, those of us you know in the industry know what it is. So, right click on databases, go to new database, and yes, it really is this simple to make a new database in SQL Server. Uh, again, this is on my laptop, so you're gonna notice that these two paths here are the same. For me, that works. In a production environment, you're gonna wanna have a much better idea of where you want your data. Anyhow, we're going to make, because this is a teaser video to get you come to my class, we're going to call it Teaser. Perfect, right? I like to name my databases SA, or not name them, sorry, give ownership of them to the SA account because I know that's going to not go away. I've seen issues where if the owner of the database is the person that created it and they leave the company or their account gets disabled, the database has issues. There's some other things that they'll actually flat out fail if they're named for somebody that just left. So we'll move off of that. And something that you need to notice here, these first two columns both have teaser in the name. The first one is your data itself. If you have a customer's database and you have a customer logical name, all your rows of information about your customer are going to wind up in this file. The second file is the log file. That is for the transaction log. Basically what that does, and I'm going to summarize a whole bunch of information here by saying any create, update, or delete statement, anything that actually changes data or the database itself, regular data or metadata, that goes through this transaction log before it winds up in this rows data file. So it goes from here to here. Well, it starts at your keyboard, then goes here, then goes here. 
that's basically just means there's two types of file. They each have their own function. This is where they're named. Uh, we'll ignore file group for now. We can get into that, but that's for a, it's a more advanced topic on how you lay out your files and what kind of data goes where. Some of these things for just this, what I'm doing today, the initial size of four megs, I would never use that in production because that's a teeny tiny database that barely holds anything. Um, the auto growth, I have, I, I can go into dissertation on that, but I won't. One meg is ridiculous. 10% is ridiculous for the log file. But the path, again, you know, if you're on a production box and you're creating this, these defaults are picked up from whatever I have set at the instance level of SQL Server. For this laptop, they're fine because this is the path for my SQL 2014 instance. It's going to put both of them in here. If I wanted to change something from the defaults for the actual physical file name on disk, this is where I would do it. I'm not going to, but what I am going to show you is what it looks like after I click OK, and I'm ignoring all these other options and things here, which in production I would not do this, or in any kind of a real real need, even in development, I would do I would pick a few things here. But I'm just going to hit OK, and if you expand the databases node, there's my teaser database that I just created. I'm going to go to Properties, and I'm going to go to Files, which is basically right back where we were. See, we've still got, we've got the SA owner. The teaser is grayed out because you can't change it here. There's the data. There's the log file with all those defaults I talked about. And then what you've got here, the default for a data file, the first data file, is teaser.mdf. It's the logical name .mdf. I like to call it the Microsoft data file or the master data file. It doesn't really necessarily mean that, but Industry-wide, if you talk to a SQL Server person about the MDF file, they know you're talking about where the data actually lives. The log file picks up the logical name and sticks .ldf at the end of it for log data file. Makes perfect sense. Finally, we have something that actually makes sense. Great. If I realize that I intended to actually have two data files, one for table data and one for index data, we can just click the Add button down here. And just to make it painfully obvious, I'm going to call this teaser dot, or sorry, underscore indexes. It's going to be a rows data because index data is actually stored in the same type of way as your regular table data that you think of, because it is just more data. It's just data about data, if you will. And then we go over here and we notice that we're still in the data folder because it's, again, it's picking up the default. And here, I can skip this, but I'm going to go ahead and call it something obvious, just in case that I don't like the default. Teaser index dot, in this case, I'm going to call it dot NDF for next data file. Again, that is an industry standard across all SQL Server. It's not a requirement. I could call this file gem.bob dot index if I wanted to, and it would take it. Of course, when I did this and a DBA came along, he would find me at my desk and, and call me names and point his, shake his finger at me that now he has to t take the database offline in order to change that name to something that makes sense. I tab off of that. I hit OK. I go back into it. Go to Properties. Go to Files. And there they are. It reordered the, the it puts them in order by the file type. But there they are. The original one or the master data file, whatever you want to call it the next data file, which is the one I created, and then the log data file. And that's it. It's from the, at the database level, it's just the files that you created. There's nothing more to it. There's a minimum of two. You cannot have a data file without a log file and have your database start. It just won't do it. You cannot mess with these files while the database is online and the SQL Server is online. The SQL Server has a hook into them or a handle, and they're, so they're in use and you can't touch them. You can't rename them on the, on the drive. Um, you can go here and you'll see all the ones that match these are in this directory on my system. I'm not going to do that right now. So one other thing that is absolutely required, you could have all those files in the right place with the right names. And if your database won't come online when you restart SQL Server, it can be simply be because there is a record in the master database. And I don't type in demos very often because I don't do it well. Master databases. If you go here and the, the master database is one of the system databases that ships with the product. Every database has a record in this in this in this table. It's actually a view, but whatever. There's the one we just created. So when SQL Server starts, it goes to its master database and says, "Hey, what all databases you have?" It says, "Well, I've got these four here." 
that are system databases, arguably including these two as well, and these are all user level databases. But what I know about each of them is that they are in these following locations. And what we're actually going to be seeing here, let me scroll over, it's the MDF file. The MDF file, it contains information about where the LDF file is. So between these, this record and the MDF, the whole database comes online, or any additional data files all come online if they're there and there's no corruption issues or somebody hasn't messed around and renamed a file without this also being renamed when you actually click on the proper one there. You know, if, if somebody has named the file while the SQL Server is down and called it, you know, teaserdata.mdf, if SQL Server doesn't know about that, it's not coming online because it's looking for this file, which no longer exists. So a record in this master database, and then the two or three or however many files you've created, two by default, that's what makes up a SQL Server database. There's a lot of stuff inside it as far as tables and views and, and security issues and things like that. But from a physical, what's on the drive and where do I find it type of question, two files, one record, that's your database. It's no more complicated than that. I've probably even already oversold it. So I hope you enjoyed this and have a little bit of an understanding of something you didn't before. And hopefully this was uh, easy for you to understand and kind of gives you some insight into the way I teach all of my fundamentals concept going from the SQL Server security model to what is a database starting at the very beginning, some backup and restore things, a little bit of disaster recovery, uh, high availability and disaster recovery options there. I plug all of that into one day and I do it in a way that it doesn't make your head explode. We don't go in depth on any of these things and to be honest with you, I'm a little bit of a storyteller because I've been doing this for so long. I've brought servers back from the dead and I've blown some up and, and, and got yelled at for it. So I will share my mistakes with you just as much as I share the time I was awesome and got something done right at three o'clock in the morning. So I hope you liked it and I hope you come to one of my classes sometime. Have a great day.